Hello, I'm Austin Lee, Assistant Professor in the School of Design. I'm pleased to be with you tonight and have the chance to introduce our guest speakers, James Tichner and Joshua Walton. Both James and Joshua are Principal Interaction Designers at Microsoft's HoloLens division focusing on Windows Holographic. Prior to joining Microsoft, James and Joshua co-founded the lab at the Rockwell Group New York, an interaction design group in an architectural office where they've worked with award-winning museums, design firms, and interaction studios in New York and San Francisco. James is an alumnus of Eve, oh, sorry, Eriva and MIT. Uh, for your information, he has also designed the stage of the most profitable nightclub in the world, the Marquis in Las Vegas. Joshua received his master's from the Cranbrook Academy of Art, where his work focused on nonlinear narrative in new media. He and his team received the Presidential Teaching Award for their work with the art uh, with the at-risk youth in San Francisco. Finally, James and Joshua were some of the most genuine and talented people I've worked with at Microsoft. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming James and uh, Joshua. So today we're going to talk about blurring the physical and digital. We're going to start off with an idea that's really important to us. And this idea is that the future of computation is in extending and augmenting human capabilities, which is a very old idea about how to use computing. But we believe it's through the sensing and actuation of objects and environments. So why? I think that's pretty easy question to ask. Because the physical and digital are both real and meaningful in our lives. And we're really interested in how combining them we can communicate in new ways, create new experiences, and work towards a more holistic modes for human living. That sounds very grandiose, so let's try and break it down a little more than that, hopefully. I think, you know, people are familiar with the work of uh, Vanier Bush and his uh, Memex project. And I think, right, you know, this was an amazing moment in time. This was like, I guess, 70 years ago or something. Um, and it kind of had this moment where he, people really see this as this forefront of this idea of, of all the tools we see in technology today in screen based interactions, right? That you have some kind of concept of the internet. And what's really wild to me is that it kind of breaks down this idea of sort of almost treating paper as being magic. This idea of like, what if every piece of paper could be connected to every other piece of paper? And any information on that piece of paper could take you to any other. And this idea that this could be transmutable. I think that's really powerful, but I'm not interested only in paper as a design surface. And I think that that's, um, if we go back before we had screens, paper was just one way that we solved design problems. And so the question is, what do we do with the physical world? And I'm really, we're really inspired by this um, paper that Don Norman put out in the early 90s um, about the towers of Hanoi. And hopefully uh, some people have read this, but I, I've gone back to this a few times and I find it really inspirational. And in the paper um, he did with his co-author about how you can embed, they made three games and they embedded more and more of the rules or the cognition of the game into the physical world, right? So the towers of Hanoi, you have to move the, the donuts over one at a time and you can never put a bigger donut on top of a smaller donut. So the right? classic version of the game is in the center. And that's, that's what these people are doing, right? But the same game can be played as this game of oranges, right? So in the game of oranges, you have three plates and you have three oranges and you can never put a bigger orange onto a plate that already has a smaller orange. And then the last one is the game of coffee cups, and similarly you can. But what's interesting is how people will, you, they're kind of ranked as more and more of the cognition, more and more of the information is embedded into the physical world, and it's native to you as a human to how the rules are. You don't have to like embed them into your brain, right? So it's really hard to do the oranges, because you're like, when did I put that orange there? Where am I on this stack? Um, 
it's kind of easy to do the Towers of Hanoi, and it's really easy on the coffee cups, because there's a lot that tells you not to put a small coffee cup into a full cup of coffee, because you'll spill coffee everywhere. And so, to me, this kind of like frames up this challenge uh, in a very precise way about how, what the value is of putting information into the physical world. So, I'm Joshua Walton. James Titchener. Um, we're really happy that we have this opportunity to be here with all of you today. Um, and we're going to kind of talk about um, this idea we shared at the beginning and how that's influenced us throughout our careers thus far. Um, so this is the slide that sort of talks about what each of us were doing before we met. So when I was at Cranbrook, um, and before that I lived in San Francisco and worked at this place called Future Farmers, um, doing interactive installation kind of work, and when I was in graduate school, I was really interested in generative systems and in computer vision. And so this installation here is um, measuring the shape of someone's head using principles from phrenology, which is a completely debunked uh, type of science. Um, but I wanted to use computer vision to measure the shape of people's heads and then um, tell them about themselves based on that. And so it's just trying to express this idea through um, this technological tool. And then. Myself, I had been working in architecture. I went to um, MIT and I was focused on transmateriality and doing projects where a material was an input and an output, trying to figure out what that meant um, and doing projects like growing crystals as joinery. So trying to understand about the material world, if it could be more um, dynamic, what that would mean. So we met um, after graduate school, I moved to New York, and I began working on an inter interdisciplinary design team at the Rockwell Group. Um, the Rockwell Group's a really interesting organization, so they do architecture and experience design. Um, they also help develop brands, so they help develop the W Hotel brand. Um, big events like the Academy Awards, they uh, were very interested in this idea of spectacle. Um, they collaborated with Bruce Mao um, on a book on spectacle. But the thing that was amazing coming in as a designer was that when you worked in these interdisciplinary teams, so for instance, for Nobu, these restaurants, we would work with everyone from the chefs to the interior designers to the um, people doing menu design to the um, architects. All of those people would work together. Um, and it really let a, uh, exposed us to many different ways of working with design. And the role that James and I had there was as technologists. So we would kind of think about, well, what's the role of technology in this space or in this project? And maybe there isn't one. And part of our goal was to help designers get over their intimidation of technology and be able to use it like a medium like they would any other kind of medium. So like they could, no designer is afraid to start playing with different materials. We, want, we wanted to encourage that same way of thinking about technology and to sort of um, get over those, those points of fear. So here are some photos of some of the, our kind of work environment at that time. There's us working on something involving grass, um, hard at work collaborating. Uh, I think there's a strong sense of play in the kind of work that we were doing at the Rockwell Group, and we'll show that more as the, the projects, and obviously a culture of, of making and prototyping as a way to understand a problem and to communicate with clients. So this part from the Rockwell Group mission has always stuck with me, and I hope it'll be meaningful to you as well. In part of their mission, they talk about collaboration with its comfort and complexity. And there's these moments in collaboration um, where you realize at some point that you're using the same words, but you mean something completely different. And there's, people talk about all of these wonderful things about collaboration, but there's an inherent complexity in just being on the same page in terms of language and understanding where are people's values and what are they bringing to the project. Yeah, and I, I like this because I always feel like complexity is almost code for discomfort <laughs> in this quote and just being honest about that it's not always going to be comfortable. So, you know, this was our team. This was the, the lab at the Rockwell Group. But I think as our mission statement of our group, we were really interested in this idea of choreographing environments, right? The idea that the whole environment could work together to tell uh, a single story, to tell, to create some kind of experience, and then the areas of intervention of where we would craft a interaction could be 
objects. It could be the whole environment. It could be um, just something that happens through the uh, interaction that peoples do, or it could be a story you tell at the space. And to see those as our frames of where, our, where we're crafting a thing um, was really valuable because then really trying to think about this whole environment working together. So we proposed, um, after collaborating on an inter inter interdisciplinary team, to start this lab and really focus on this relationship of blurring the physical digital and pushing this idea of using the technology as material. And in the beginning, what we wanted to do is start with augmenting the physical world and giving it digital attributes. So this was an early project we did of um, a series of connected lights. So each light, when you pick it up, it, you know, it was very straightforward. It was early days. You could tilt it, and it would change color. Um, and then all the lights had a relationship. And so the other lights would also turn on, but each light would have some kind of uh, variation relative to the first one. But then when multiple people played with them together, they would sync up. And so there were kind of two key moments there from an interaction perspective that we tried to focus on. That initial moment of picking it up and feeling that you're wielding power, feeling that you are orchestrating all these together. And then that moment of sh you could shake two and they would come into sync. And that moment that this nonverbal touch or the synchronicity between two people was something that we were really chasing and trying to build that upon. So in this case, we're sort of taking this digital attribute of the network and adding it into these physical objects. And we did a lot of prototyping around this. This is one of my favorite videos of a prototype because this is a very homemade version of the Internet of Things where we started with milk crates, um, some paper cups that we embedded uh, microphones into. Um, and we just started to begin to connect all of these things together so that we could focus more on what these things are saying to each other. And this was a very quick, but I, I, I still had a big effect on me in terms of a prototype about what it's going to mean when these objects can interrelate. Yeah, and I think that, that becomes a, a common theme in the work where trying to move past that moment of just having things connected and more into the moment of when, they, when they're choreographed, what are they trying to say, um, and how that interacts with as people as part of that choreographed system. And this led to another piece of software that we developed called Space Brew. And the, the goal of Space Brew was really around making it so that you could focus on that moment of what things are going to say to each other. So Space Brew is a library that lets you connect different projects constructed in different technologies and allow them to speak to one another. Um, and this is a series of uh, sort of, j we call them jam sessions. Um, and we actually did, we played like improv games he here. Um, with the technology. So this is a case of zip, zap, zow, where uh, the input of one technology goes to the output of the, of the other. So this split screen is someone came in with a project and they've connected it to someone else's project. Um, and then that part starts working right away. <laughs> and they start um, evolving um, the conversation that the, these objects are having with each other. And, and what was nice is that we would begin the workshop by doing the improv exercise of where you point and you zip, zap, zow, and then eventually part of the bridge would become through technology, but then to go to the next piece, the one person would have to be listening and then jump and then jump. And I think that this was a, uh, this is an open source project that we made that's it's really focused on sort of the workshop scale of something where people could get together and make something really quickly um, and test it out um, as a way to see if it's any, anything worth doing. So many of those projects and other projects, we um, have contributed back to um, the community. And part of the idea there is that if, if the software was not an integral part of the solution, but was just the material we used in which to um, achieve the project, we wanted to be able to share it. So um, we have a couple things that are still available. We have this thing called TSPS, which is a toolkit for sensing people in spaces. Um, not, not a great name. But uh, the TSPS was great, and that you see in the top center um, that builds on some other computer vision libraries that helps you just quickly understand when people are moving in and out of a space using camera um, technology. And then, of course, Space Brew. 
And later we um, collaborated with Google on something called Google Interactive Spaces, um, which is also available. And Google Interactive Spaces is essentially like an operating system for buildings. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So at the same time, we were also applying all of these technologies we were building and experiments into specific projects. So just to give you an example of a couple projects, this is the um, entry piece to the 2008 Venice Biennale. And um, the curator was very interested in this relationship of film and architecture. Um, and in this piece, Hall of Fragments, what we're doing is um, deconstructing pieces of film frame by frame. And as people move through the space, they are generating architectures out of these frames of film. And there's a couple really important ideas in here that we kept carrying throughout the work. So this was written in um, Open Frameworks. And part of the idea here was that we wanted to have an environment in which um, it wasn't a looping video or anything like that, but was actually generative and people were participating in the construction of the architecture. So behind these projection screens are a series of films that we worked with the curator on. And that was by far the most difficult part of the project was getting the rights to 50 films. Um, but once we did that, we were writing software that could in real time sort of deconstruct the frames and people as they walk through the space would build these structures. And if you're on the other side of the piece, you can see the pieces of the film get sort of sucked up into the screen um, as you watch people move through the space. And I think another thing that was interesting is, and that we carried a lot forward after this project, was it would have moments where it was just reacting to people walking through, and then we had these cyclical uh, spectacle moments where all the videos would sync and this wash would fill on all of them. And I think balancing, um, initially I think I, we had some anxiety about how to balance those two, but then um, it really panned out to understand, like, when are you doing something for a large crowd and when are you doing something for one person and how do you uh, go between those two. And the Biennale in the opening weekend has tens of thousands of people move through the space and then that changes over time. So the pacing of that changed over time. Initially we thought, oh, these spectacles would happen once an hour. We ended up doing them every two and a half minutes during the opening um, because there was just that, that sort of density that we needed to, um, to use. So this is a project we did just for an event. Uh, it was one night at the Four Seasons Hotel in New York. And what it was was a sort of chandelier made out of a weather balloon that we projected upon and then in, hovered over a fountain that was in the space. And we gave out a series of uh, maracas that people could shake. And when they shook the maracas, it would um, add energy to the particle system, but also change the words that are up there. And I think the thing that surprised me, the surprised us the most on this project was it, it felt like we were really doing this project about the technology and the sensing and all of this, but what was most successful and what uh, carried forward was actually the social interactions that people had. Um, that they used it initially as an icebreaker, as ways to talk to each other. And then a lot of times it wasn't just like, hey, what did this do? But people could take these roles of explaining to someone else or brainstorming with someone else what it would do. And to me, that's, a, that's like a really interesting way to approach uh, part of event design. It's something that I think event design takes on a lot. And to really bring that into interaction design was really exciting to us and, and successful in this event. And this really sparked these simple interactions in which we could get um, help people socially connect within the space. And then begin shaking the maracas more and more. So they got out of control. Until they smashed them. Um, so one of our largest scale projects was um, a digital art platform we created for the Cosmopolitan Hotel in Las Vegas. And the idea here is originally this space had these large concrete columns. And we wanted to be able to transform the space. And early in the brainstorming, people were frustrated by these huge concrete columns. And they said, I wish we could just get rid of these. They're the main supports of the building. Um, and so we had this idea that what, what if we could dematerialize the columns so that they sort of disappear right in front of people's eyes when they're in the space. 
And so this installation consists of about 400 screens behind a sort of custom half silver mirror. Um, and the idea is that everything you're seeing here is software. So there's nothing in here that is video. And a big part of us with, it, with a space is that we want to talk about, um, we, we sort of compare it to this notion of looking at the ocean or being in a park where um, we don't want people to have a sense that they come up to it and then they, the joke we would say is like going to the ocean and being like, when is, when's it over? Um, we don't ever want to have that moment. We want to have something that is much more ambient and ephemeral. And if you come back to the environment, you can recognize it as the same piece, but it will never look exactly the same. And including here, the interaction is incredibly subtle. So in some of these pieces, for instance, with the leaves, if you linger long enough, these deer will come and interact with you. Um, but it's, it's a very indirect form of interaction. And that was very purposeful because we don't want people just kind of standing in front of the column saying, going like this and being like, I get it, and walking away, which is something that could very easily happen with this kind of installation. Um, and then uh, you want to talk about the, the platform aspect of this piece, too. Sure. I think that was, you know, we built it to be uh, a digital platform and something that could transform over time. It's meant to be a spectacle. It's meant to be, in Vegas, you know, you invest in spectacles and it pays off a certain amount for people to come to see it. And here, the, the function was really like, it was the entrance of the space, so you kind of were washed in media and kind of were able, gave you a chance to become your Vegas self as you like went through the lobby, whatever that might mean to you. Um, so we did, we, we designed the, the platform, designed the installation, and designed some of the content on it and then collaborated with uh, Digital Kitchen and with uh, the Art Production Fund to do additional work on it. And so here, actually, there were some video pieces that we did for it and some generative pieces. And the generative pieces were, um, we're super proud of the generative pieces. And, and I know uh, Casey Rees did a generative piece for it and a few other people, but it was really hard for people to wrap their head around so much, so many screens and this like, esoteric way of making things. And so one thing we really learned was to spend more time on the scaffolding to allow other people. Because the one of the most successful things that we made for it was actually just a piece that took existing video art and layered it up so it could be put in there. Yeah, that was a funny moment when the, we would work with video artists and they would say, what's the resolution? And we'd say, it's 48,000 by 4,000 pixels. And they're like, well, how do, what do, how do I even make something for that? Um, and you have to rethink how you're going to construct for that environment. And so a big part of what we did is help lead people through that process. And also lead people through the process of making media designed for a space versus media designed for uh, a screen. So that led to doing other projects where we would make media uh, platforms for spaces. And this was at Google. We made uh, a number of interactive spaces for them with this, this approach of making an API for the space. And here you could see um, on the bottom left, on the left-hand side, the physical space and then the, uh, the virtual space on a website. And it's, it's such a, that one we built enough scaffolding that they could easily reprogram it. They had this tool to see what it was gonna look like ahead of time. It worked really clearly with APIs that they had. And um, what was really surprising is we made some really uh, emotionally powerful pieces, and we made some that were much more easy to maintain. And, and it's really amazing to watch which ones could continue to live as you step out. That's one of the interesting things in doing an interactive space. I think in architecture, you're always kind of like making a thing and then leaving it. Um, and interactive spaces are oddly like landscape um, in the sense that they need someone to maintain them. They change over time. They can go grow wild, um, or they can just seem stagnant. And here's some more from that same. Uh, we did a, a number of installations for them around the globe, so showing some. I think what was really wild for us with this is that, you know, since they were Google, um, we moved a lot of our work into using into web tools, which was really exciting and fun to be able to like push on the, what those were able to do um, in a specific located space at that time. Yeah, everything you've seen in these last two are just things in Chrome, including. Um, all the interactives are all in Chrome. 
Um, and then we started thinking with them about what the role of data could be in the environment. Um, so we started prototyping and sketching um, ideas about how to take these editable data environments and allow people to live in them. And the hope there is to sort of give more visceral feedback to the data because you're living with it every day as you move through these spaces. Um, and so this, uh, this top right is a sort of example of the kind of sketching and prototyping we were doing to convey those ideas. And the, the, the last project um, that we collaborated on with them was uh, the Google Cultural Institute in Paris. And this was a sort of premonition of the thing we were about to transition to because this was about taking a huge archive of information and through a social gestural interface allowing a group of curators to talk about the content itself. And so in this case, multiple people can work together in the environment to filter the information in different ways and save that out in order to use um, in curatorial projects. Um, some, more, some work we did around uh, this project that the Rockwell Group had done, the Imagination Playground. It was a series, it's a great project, a series of blocks to allow free play for children. Um, and what we did was made a digital aspect of it so that they could it was in a museum setting and give kids a place where they could just break a lot of blocks and throw them down. Without so they, hurting each other. Yeah. <laughs> or taking up too much space. But that was a fun project. It's really fun to do playful things. And then this is a great project. This was in, uh, I think it's on Fifth Avenue in New York. It's a, uh, thir Third Avenue, sorry. <laughs> it's a, uh, Renovation of a lobby space, and it has a series of tiles that change opacity um, in the front and trying to make a kaleidoscopic effect. Um, and what was amazing about this is this just opened, and we had, uh, it pretty much matches where we left the project off uh, three and a half years ago. So it was the last thing that Josh and I were working on when we were at the lab before we went to, to work at Microsoft. and the speed of architecture um, is really slow. So it was really wild to see this come out. And also, sometimes you get nervous. This is, sometimes you're like, oh, if I'm not there, is this even gonna happen? And this was a surprise that it, it, um, the client was happy enough and the right people were still there and it got pushed through. Um, so it's really exciting. So we got a call one day saying that um, Microsoft would be interested in working with us on the kinds of design that we had been doing. And we were a bit skeptical of whether it was the right fit or not. Um, because we are, as you can see from our body of work thus far, we're completely obsessed and love the physical world and how technology can work in the physical world. Um, but going back to how to think about computation and objects and environments, um, they said, you know, what if we could begin to think about how to flip that and begin to give digital objects physical properties? Mm -hmm. um, and so we went away to do this project. Microsoft HoloLens brings holograms into your real world. Using transparent lenses, spatial sound, and an understanding of your environment, holograms look and sound like they're actually part of the world around you. That is mixed reality. With Microsoft HoloLens, holograms are viewed through the holographic frame centered in the middle of your view. This preserves your peripheral vision so you can move freely and connect and collaborate with the people around you. Holograms in mixed reality don't block out what you can see and hear. This enables you to engage with digital content and tools alongside the objects in your real world. Holograms can be world-locked in a physical location, so you can walk around them, or they can travel with you. You can even hear them in 3D with spatial sound. Microsoft HoloLens is the world's first fully untethered, self-contained holographic computer. With the mixed reality experience of HoloLens, you can stay in the real world and interact with real people as you simultaneously explore 3D in 3D. So 
Out of curiosity, how many people have tried a hollow lens? Yes. Oh. Fantastic. Um, so we'd like to talk a little bit about the role of design within the development of this product. Um, one of the first things is something James and I are both really passionate about. Yeah, and this is the design, how design can impact sensing. So this is the part of the HoloLens that contains the, the sensors of how it understands the world. And this is, I think, something that, you know, people often say design is communication, but so often it's what they mean is that it's saying something. And communication is a lot about listening. The, in this case, it was what parts of the world do we listen to? What parts of the world do we understand? What are the scenarios and the success of what will be the right set of sensors for us to be able to understand and comprehend the world and the people in that environment? And because the world is such a rich place, there really is a great role for design here to understand what are the things that are really meaningful about what to sense in people, objects, and environments. And so in this case, we knew that we wanted people to be able to uh, understand where they were within the environment. And, and that is really the key to how we world lock um, holograms into a specific location. Now, across the design in general, we wanted it to be a mixed reality device, meaning we wanted people to be able to be very immersed in the physical world they're in, but also immersed in the digital content. Um, and be able to sort of slide back and forth between those modes. So a big part of both of this, which is the see-through display, but also the sort of reddish orange parts, which are a, um, a mixed reality kind of speaker system, are about allowing you to hear and interact and be with the people that are in the room, but also be able to um, have this digital content. And part of this, is a really interesting challenge for us right now because we're trying to think about what does it mean to have these objects that are a sort of blur between having physical properties and digital properties. And for us, it's a really exciting opportunity right now to think through that space and say, well, um, what should those characteristics be? And I, I tell this one example that I, I really love where um, we put a physical, physical, Oh boy. Um, we put a digital sort of table out into the world, and that table had rounded, or I mean, sharp edges. And we noticed through user testing that people would take the time on this completely holographic, non real, made of light table to go around the sharp edge because you've done that your whole life. And so we ended up, they modified the design to round the edges of that table so that people could move around it faster. Um, and it made me realize that um, when we start to talk about environments, it's a bit like being a fish in water. Um, we have a really difficult time even describing how they've affected us. And so to us, this is one of the most exciting spaces is to think about what are the kind of affordances of holographic objects that tell us their digital attributes, but also their physical attributes. Um, for instance, uh, Sometimes when you would world lock a hologram, people would want it to rotate with them as they moved around it. But what's incredibly frustrating about that is you can never see behind the object because it just keeps rotating with you. Um, and so world locking and letting people interact with it as they would any other object in the world um, gives a lot of uh, sort of free interaction benefit. Yeah, it starts to kind of create this sense of object permanence that you know, as a, as a human, you learn at a very young age, but to be able to treat a digital object with that sense of object permanence within the physical world is, is hard to understand. And it's very strange where if, when you come back later and the things are still there, it's kind of hard to, um, it's hard to, because we have all these expectations that it doesn't work. Um, but what we found is that, you know, if, if a person places a digital op a holographic object in a space, um, they'll come back and know exactly where it is uh, a long time later. Yeah, in fact, there's a, a fun, kids will often after they try it, will be able to tell you where every hologram yeah, is my, in the room. My daughter will often, she'll go around and see all the stuff and then when someone else puts it on, she'll be their tour guide pointing to, pointing to nowhere. <laughs> She's six, by the way. Um, 
And there was a really interesting part of this process. So this is the kind of brains of this thing we call the HPU. And this is a very sort of technical piece of the puzzle where we're trying to create new hardware in order to support this new sensing. And one of the roles and sort of ideas we've been thinking about in relationship to design is, do we have the right tools for this within the design community? So in this case, we're using a lot of machine learning um, and a lot of, uh, um, a lot of different tools within computer science that don't necessarily have great uh, ability to be manipulated by designers. And so one of the things we're thinking of is like, can we, do we need to be developing new tools right now that can help designers work with this like a medium or like a material? And I think um, it's pretty clear that we do and we're starting to see some different people in the community develop those tools. So right now, though, this is the early days of this project, and this is sort of this, this blank slate for us to put new stuff in. And I think one of the, you can think about that, this image shows that it, it mapping the physical world and understanding where it is, and that really is this slate that we're able to put these digital objects into as we kind of see what other people imagine as these digital objects is really the stage we're at right now with the dev kit. And you know, we, we really think of this as a new medium. And so when we look at this, we think, you know, what is the nature of this new medium going to be? How are we going to shape this? Is it going to be games and entertainment? These will obviously come, but it'll be interesting as the storytelling of these moves beyond just these kinds of uh, well-known tropes. And for us, it's been really exciting to see how people are thinking about teaching and learning um, within these environments. So this is an example of uh, Skype. Um, and Austin here uh, is someone who worked on this project. Um, both of us had a really great personal experience with this project where in one of the demos, we asked people to either uh, fix a light switch or in this case, like repair plumbing something that might be really out of your comfort zone. And one of the things that's, that Skype allows you to do is sort of see through someone's eyes and be able to draw in their world and help walk them through a scenario. And I kind of think it's like the ultimate phone a friend sort of idea that you can say like, I'm looking at this, like for instance, I think of it when I do electronics, like I'm looking at this circuit, I don't know what any of these things mean. Uh, <laughs> and I call my friend, I'm like, I think I'm gonna break this or, Possibly not. Um, and it, it, it really changes how you can um, uh, teach people, but also it just offers you another tool for communication. Yeah, I think it's obviously right now, um, the teaching example is very clear. I know my wife was like blown away that she changed a light switch. And I was like, we could have done that together anyway, if that's what you were looking for. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, but, you know, communication is this, it's like, I think it was, there's like an Alan Kay quote about like what are the three things computers are good at and it's communication, communication, and communication. And so we often don't even realize that that's a lot of what we're doing in things like productivity. So um, speaking of that, I think we have a little video showing another one of those tools. Oh, no, no. not yet. So uh, <laughs> the, the last part is that there's certain things we could begin to just completely rethink. So how many people here have ever done 3D modeling? Amazing. So you'll relate to this problem of, there's, it's pretty different doing 3D modeling in the physical world and in the digital world. And there's some people who just have a really hard time grasping, um, doing, always having to translate onto the screen and back and forth. And so we've been really looking at tools, in this case modeling tools that you could completely rethink how these things are constructed and sort of mix a little bit of these two worlds together in order to build things in a new way. And now I'm gonna share that video. I'm a huge fan <laughs> of the dinosaur hologram. There are very few situations that aren't improved by a holographic goat. I think my favorite action ground is still our zombie named Ned. He's a great actor. Action Graham is part of the first wave of launch applications for HoloLens. The main point of ActionGram is to allow a user to tell a story by putting holograms in their world and then recording them and then share that 
So we give you a huge collection of holographic characters and props and tools, and you can use that to put holograms into the story that you want to tell. My most popular video on YouTube, one of my friends spent hours adding effects in the future with holograms. I could maybe do those things in an afternoon. If you don't know how to use VFX or you don't have actor friends, you can't make the type of content that ActionGram is going to allow you to be able to make. Our app is focused on humorous content, things that you might want to share online. But there's so many other forms of storytelling, educational storytelling, or instructional storytelling. And I think that's really exciting for developers. No question in my mind that a small garage development team could easily make a HoloLens application. It's really no different than developing for any other mobile platform. The differences are in how you solve your problems rather than on the technical side. We're on the cutting edge of this becoming the way people consume media and create media. I'm just so excited to watch that progress. So we love this in terms of its communication and bringing the ability to do kind of lightweight visual effects in real time into your own videos. And also I love that it often people's Videos are about mixing things in their physical environment with these digital objects in order to tell a story. Yeah, I think, you know, in, the, in that video, sorry, did I let you go through? <laughs> Keep going. The, um, what's really wild, and it tells this great story about mixed reality, where the storytelling is both about this virtual element that could be repeated anywhere, and then the specificity of that physical environment. You know what I mean? And that the story is transformed by you know, the, the zombie on the record player is not the same as the zombie in the park or the same as the, the zombie in, in the bedroom. Um, that sounded weird, but the, um, <laughs> but I think that's it, you know, specificity, they have this saying that, that specificity is the soul of narrative. And, and as these narrative stories move into your physical world, it'll feel really different and really exciting. And, and that Action Grams is a great project that starts to scratch that surface. So in the background here, we're also playing a, a sort of professional application uh, in a collaboration with Autodesk. We've been thinking about how to sort of leverage the, the sort of best of what these tools do with new capabilities that are possible in the digital. And part of this is really about rapid prototyping. So we're seeing a lot of cases where sometimes you might 3D print. We also look at how we can just quickly mock things up holographically as an even lighter weight step before 3D printing. Um, so this is an example of some people working on a robotic arm, um, in which case they're, they're really trying to um, collaborate across disciplines. And in individual applications, we see too that um, people often develop their applications so that multiple people are seeing the same thing at the same time. And this really can facilitate a very classic type of collaboration where you're all sitting around the project and uh, critiquing it and thinking about um, what the next steps might be. And you know, this is just an example of many. We're at the stage of the project where the dev kit is out, um, another number of people who are willing to deal with it, with a product that's still at a dev kit stage have it, and then we're doing a number of uh, collaborations with different enterprises and partnerships to, to learn more and more from what their needs are. And um, I don't know, it's a, it's a really great way to have learnings for the platform as we iterate and move on. So we'd like to sort of end off with where we began, which is this idea of extending and augmenting through sensing and actuation of objects and environments. And I think we're at a really interesting time right now where between what is happening in the sort of virtual and mixed reality world, the internet of things, um, and that th we have a much more robust web uh, World Wide Web, that we can begin to think about new ways in which these things work together. And having spent the first part of our career really embedding this digital properties into the physical, and now working on embedding the uh, physical properties into the digital, we're ready to take the next step of creating richer sort of blurs between these two spaces. Um, yeah, we hope to see you in mixed reality. Thanks. Thanks.
So I guess we have a little, uh, 10 minutes for Q and A. Is there, is there like a second microphone or? Are there any questions? I can hand off my. Austin, you want to take my? Any questions? All right, hold on. Let me bring you a mic. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Well, I will say one thing I've definitely learned from creating these social environments is that people would rather, and, and even in many of our examples, people would rather be looking at the same thing at the same time because it allows you a richer set of interactions. So I, I'm hopeful, uh, just in general, that actually people tend to prefer this more social version of the technology. Um, and so I, I guess that, that is, that is the, the first part of it. And then I think the next part is, that, um, is about being very social creatures who want to communicate, um, that we'll develop more of these, because we will want to be communicating, even the things where you're not seeing the thing at the same time, it's often still a tool for communication. Like you're leaving a note for someone, then someone else comes and sees that note. And so, I, I guess it's been really in, inspiring for me that nearly every company that has come to work with us is really interested in those shared experiences. I think what's also, you know, we, you know, the physical environment also clearly is set up to allow that, that you have you, you will have private spaces. We already have private spaces where we want to do things um, by ourselves or in isolation. And then usually when we make the effort to be in more public spaces, there's, you know, and there's gradations of public spaces. There's like things where we're all working on the same thing. And then there's, uh, you know, public, public spaces where you kind of are together or you're familiar strangers. And I think there'll be gradations of that to kind of reflect Ha the kinds of spaces that we've built for ourselves in the physical world, we'll try and mimic them in the virtual world. So the same way, when you're all in the same, like right now, we've all gathered together and we have like one clear thing. I think it would be an assumption that most of us want to focus on the same thing. And you can imagine on the on like a semi-public space, like a campus, people d will have diversions or be in groups or have times when they want to all see the same thing. And at home, you would want to be like completely in your own room or maybe your teenager would be like, I'm not seeing what you're seeing, Mom. So I don't know. I think it'll reflect the physical world a lot. Uh, I had a question about what kind of interaction models you tested out or prototyped. Uh, as from the video right now, it's a gesture-based interaction. But did you go from controllers to something else, to something else, and then finally come at gesture-based? Sure. We we sh wanted to make a. Uh, it was really important that you with this vision of being they're human centric and that we're building an interaction model that's based around the w how humans um, understand the world and how they interact with the world. And so we kind of break that into these genres of gaze, gesture, and voice. And this is a, a we see, you know, obviously this isn't full, have the full richness of all of your gesture and it doesn't have the full conversation of all your voice or all that understanding. So this is a step towards that. Um, what's interesting is I actually, what we also shipped was uh, you can use it with a Bluetooth mouse and keyboard. And so what we found is there were scenarios that were built for HoloLens about where we see this vision of using it, where you're walking around and you're using it for a long period of time and it's very hands-free and it's very completely self-contained. Um, but there's also a number of scenarios where people wanna sit at a desk or sit at a table and have that fine grain level of control. Um, and because the whole 
one of the great things about being at Microsoft is this platformization that it's built on top of Windows 10 is that we were able to light up the, the mouse and keyboard and the mouse pointer actually just moves through the physical world. It's kind of, it's fun. So. Hi. Um, so my question is, um, HoloLens sort of explores this totally new world of mixed reality. Like this type of interaction design just hasn't really been done before. So I was wondering, like, as interaction designers exploring this totally new medium, what are some of the things you've had to consider and the questions you've had to think about that wouldn't be so obvious in, like, defining a new medium? Um, well, we definitely, there's one phrase we use frequently, which is listen to the medium, which is just a sort of reminder for ourselves. But I guess first I want to say that um, there's, a, there's a project in 1968 called the Sword of Damocles that Ivan Sutherland worked on that is... Um, I, don't, I wish I had a video of it right now, but it's a, a really interesting headset done in 1968. And sometimes I feel like my whole career is basically just finishing 1968. Um, and it's really humbling and powerful to go and, and see those, those videos. Um, and then I think um, what, what's really exciting to us coming from the world of environments is that if you think about, say, let's take, for instance, like text in the environment. You can look at things like exhibit design, or you can look at things like uh, signage, and learn all of these things from the physical world already. And so, um, in many of these things, people are looking at gaming and at cinema, and I'm much more interested in looking at um, installation art, uh, event design, um, all of these other sort of ways in which we've designed specific moments for spaces, um, landscape, work is really interesting. Um, I think that it's, it's so open that right now is a great time to, to, to look and see what, how other industries use or, or other disciplines use the environment and sort of what lessons can we bring from that. And I think that, um, you know, I showed some early work where I was talking about the idea of materials changing form and the idea that Actually, in all of our early work, the idea that, you know, a whole column could transform or these very parts of the physical world could have properties similar to the virtual world of being connected and, and being able to transform, maybe even physically transform. And what happens initially with, with working with any kind of mixed reality from, from something like HoloLens to a more virtual reality experience is that you can, you can change anything and, and you can get very, like, almost like drunk on digital that you're like, you could do so much and there's no limits and that's very exciting. And then what you start to realize is how, as, as humans, we've lived in the physical world. This is the fish and water kind of moment that, that you have so much innate about how you think about interacting with the world that um, you almost need to like leverage that first, you know, and, and kind of, it's a bit of a, uh, because I think on the, on the output side that we're able to make something seem like it's really there I feel like we still have a ways to go to, to, to finish that check that we've written, that we've kind of like, you know, we haven't finished the contract of, of what it means for that thing to be there, for people to fully leverage their native way of interacting with it. You know, I'm, I, I don't know, I'm very interested in, in that. Um, and, and, and then you just balance it. You're like, oh, I don't, it's of course, nobody wants to just be the physical world, but you want to leverage people's innate understandings of the world so they don't have to think as much and that's also kind of what, what I was trying to talk about with the um, Towers of Hanoi that, that you can leverage people's already people are don't have to think about the rules of putting a coffee cup on top of another because you don't want to spill the coffee I think one thing is to, um, I know when I, you know, when I showed some early work, I was just talking about it again, and you're at the point where you kind of like look back to stuff that you did about why did you do that. I know when I, when I first graduated, um, I went from MIT to Evrea mostly because I was like, I don't, 
I don't know what kind of job this is. This is like I, I want to. You sh nobody's like asking to grow crystals on on sticks. That wasn't like in high demand anywhere. Um, and so that's actually kind of like why, you know, we just had to make some things to show like, oh, it could be like this. I think it could be like this. Um, and, you know, at the time, I don't, I just kind of heard that interaction design might be a thing. And so I just kind of was like, maybe I'm an interaction designer. I don't know. Um, I just knew I didn't know how to make a web page, so that wasn't like an option. Um, and so, I don't, I don't know, I still feel that way sometimes, that I don't know, um, you, you're just like have a thesis that you're trying to do, and a thesis of like, and I think that, that makes it, it's funny because it looks so like, we're just, I'm just, we're just motivated by like fun, but you, you do have some thesis and then you have an approach, an aesthetic. I think we have a playful aesthetic about how we go through stuff. We have a thesis that we're trying to achieve, um, but like the, the project that, that Josh showed of the, uh, the, what are they called? The um, milk crates. The milk crates was for, uh, and we didn't show the whole video of it, but it was for this project in San Jose where we did like uh, this interactive installation about smart cities. And I thought it was really interesting because it's like you could see how we made it just like a playground of like interaction. And there's so many people doing great smart cities things. And I think that some other people, like similar to your question about like, do people see different things? Um, you know, people do amazing, like, critical design, and that's their approach. And I don't think that that's, um, you can think critically and have, a, and, and approach things like that, but that doesn't have to be the, the your output or how you, you kind of make stuff in the world and try and make stuff that reflects that. Hope that does that answer the question? That's a tough, that's a tough question. I definitely, um, James and I have talked a lot about, in interdisciplinary teams, both of us were a bit of generalists. And so sometimes when you come into an environment with a bunch of specialists, it's really intimidating because you feel like everyone around you in any discipline can do it better than you can. And so you're working with a graphic designer, they're so much better than you are. Then you're working with this architect and they're so much better than you are. And um, uh, I, I, I felt really uncomfortable about that early in my uh, career and I think the big shift for me was to, to go to where there's interesting problems and, and be very free about how I would contribute. So as a generalist, your strength is that you can, um, or one of, the, one of the interesting parts of that is that you can contribute in many different ways. Um, and I watched, um, part of this also is, I watched this early IBM video about how to collaborate in teams. And it was like done in the 60s and they were like, um, find any members of your team who aren't specifically adding value and eliminate them from the team. And I was like, oh. that was like a tough, tough one to watch. But uh, I think the, um, the, the, the thing I would say is like, I've definitely changed in, to think about trying to go work with and collaborate with interesting people or trying to go work on interesting problems is how I frame um, my career. And so that's what takes me to the different projects. Um, it's not so much like I want to work at this place or any of that as much as like I'm interested in this problem and this person is doing really interesting work. I wonder if I can go figure out a way to collaborate with them. And um, it immediately uh, uh, helps you feel a lot more like autonomy in how you move through your career. Um, just that kind of simple switch. Yeah, and I, think, I think when you're, when you are a generalist and, and Sometimes you, I don't know how to, how to like get at this, but your role in the project can change so much from, from piece to piece. And it's not, you're not, you just are kind of like inhabit that show up and be useful uh, approach. And, but you don't necessarily know which is the thing that you're going to do. And so getting out there and just making something that um, just keeps moving the thing down the road and pointing it the way you want it to go can can be really surprising and that's really scary i think like it means sometimes that you're going to just make something terrible and then everybody's like why did you do this and other times you having done that inspires what makes the thing the next way and then you just are and then people are like is this what you meant and you're like oh i guess we're doing what i what i said but yeah i couldn't visualize it to the same way and so um Anyway, that's kind of 
is a personal question. One, one other thing is, I, I, def I love this question. Um, <laughs> I think the other, the other thing is like, um, I think we're familiar with prototyping and we, we definitely used to, and still do push this idea of learning through making. But oftentimes, I know one reason we have collaborated over 10 years is that we both get this thing where we have to make something before we understand what it is or why it is. Um, what happens is we just have one day we're just like, I need to go make this thing. And I don't know why that happens, but we trust ourselves a lot more now to just go do it and then be like, oh, turns out it was nothing. Or every once in a while it turns into um, you know, one of these projects. But quite a few of these projects actually started as um, um, things that we had sort of you know, I kind of believe in this, like, in, like you can say intuition, but intuition is like this actually rich collection of, um, of influences in your life. And so through that, you just realize, oh, like, everyone's been approaching this problem this way. What if I approached it the other way? Um, and that, that, that can be a fantastic way to um, get started in, especially in innovation kind of work. I think I, my question is kind of gearing back to the HoloLens. Um, so you said you know you work a lot with the enterprise these days. I'm also curious about kind of like working with the education institutional spaces regarding the HoloLens project. Yeah, in terms of education. Um, so well, there's a couple different ways to approach that. One is that we we had a, um, a request for proposal that we did through Microsoft Research. Um, we had hundreds of proposals um, and I bet some of there we go uh, we have one of the uh, winners of that um, proposal right here in the audience um, and I, I, I think um, uh, that's been really great uh, for instance one thing we learned from doing that was that um, probably half of the applicants came from the medical industry and I, I wasn't really expecting that. And the reason was that they already had all of this 3D imaging data, but they didn't have great ways to display it. Um, and so what they end up doing is displaying it sort of frame by frame on a 2D screen. But whereas many other groups are like about to start capturing in 3D, they've actually been doing it for a long time. And so they've been just kind of waiting for a display technology that could work the way ours does in order to, um, to do that work. And then, uh, I think the other part is um, trying to, we've just been sort of uh, testing out and are in the very early stages of how you would structure curriculum um, for around this device. Um, I was sort of daydreaming the other day about teaching a signage class that was about just going and hanging type in the world and walking around as a class and talking about um, what that meant. Um, and. and uh, prototyping ideas around that, um, but I haven't done anything with that yet. But uh, <laughs> I think the, um, the goal is to begin to un, um, unfold more and more uh, sort of teaching and learning programs. My question was also about um, the HoloLens in relationship to education, uh, especially education for designers, um, in that if it ever is a, a commonly used tool to teach design, um, do you think that um, students uh, would ever reach the point where they were dependent on the HoloLens in such a way that they couldn't design independently from it? And uh, if that's something you think might be a possibility, uh, what is your opinion on it? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, I think the, the work we were doing that we showed with Autodesk is, is really directly related to that kind of work where, you know, companies that are making professional tools are trying to understand how their tool chain could fit with, with a device like this. I think that, um, well, I don't know, actually, I guess you could say how much people are already dependent upon those professional tool chains now. Um, with computers, I imagine you would you could in theory at some point be as dependent upon them in a different medium. Um, so I don't know if that's good or bad. 
with computers today that you could be <laughs> I don't know. I know that um, I guess part of the, the point of this talk or why we think about this way, we definitely have a strong point of view that we really love the physical world and what the physical world has to offer. And we really genuinely love the digital world and a lot of parts of social media and the web and things that the digital world brings. And so we, we always kind of reject the either or scenarios um, and say like, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that this will allow us, you know, sort of new capabilities within the physical world um, just as much as it is allowing us these digital capabilities. And so, for instance, um, we've done quite a few experiments where people are laying out, say, like exhibits or, or store kind of designs as a way to like rapid prototype. But the end goal, they're actually building a store or an exhibit. Um, it's not necessarily that the end goal in that case is digital at all. Um, and so we're seeing a sort of equal support for that right now or equal interest. And so I think in the future, you're just going to see more of both, if that makes sense. Continuing on um, education and um, working, using the HoloLens for collaboration, um, how do you guys deal with the problem of uh, collaborating with a person with this um, physical object that removes you um, from the other person you're interacting with. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, I, th I think, um, well, part of it is that uh, that drove a lot of our design decisions. I mean, the idea to have a transparent display is that I never want to not see when someone comes in the room. Um, or like in, in VR, they call that like the jumping cat problem. Like you're just in VR and this cat jumps on you and you have like freak out because you have no idea why that's happening. Um, and uh, so part of it was to start from a place where it is possible. What's really interesting is to see how people acclimate to the technology over time. I mean, it's similar with, um, we, used to, we used to, when we worked with hospitality groups, um, you can imagine a hotel owner one day comes into their lobby and they notice that everyone in their lobby is looking at their phone. And one of the things they thought was like, do we need hotel lobbies anymore? Like, what's the function of this thing? Like, this, I designed this to be the social space and now everyone's on their phone, maybe we don't need hotel lobbies. And they really like, took that as a very serious question. Um, and then you see though how the use of mobile has like evolved over time. And so we see that where people at first um, can get like, uh, they need to, a little bit of time to adjust that was something we learned from hospitality as well. Like, if you think of, I always think of people as being guests in mixed reality, and you're kind of like, are you comfortable? Do you need some water? Like, you know, how, how can we make this a positive experience? And then once they're ready, you start engaging in deeper collaboration. But it's a really amazing thing when it does sort of fall away, especially like when multiple people are looking at the same like uh, holographic object. I mean, it's just, it feels so similar to me as like when you're uh, an architect and you're all looking at a model that someone built. I mean, it just feels very much like the same kind of um, social interaction. Yeah, I think you can, you know, obviously it, it, there are social cues that you can't pick up on when someone is wearing them. But what's, what's surprising is, you know, you saw a video there where, um, when we worked with Case Western, and they have uh, a uh, part of a body that they're showing a medical exhibit, and they're showing this vector of, the, of someone's gaze of where they're looking to share with other people who are remote or maybe on a screen. And I think that's like kind of interesting because you're like, oh, I could see exactly where this guy is looking. But what's really surprising to me was when we do the ones where you, we both have the same thing, uh, we're both seeing the same object, and you just simply point at it and you're like this thing right here because then I do there's so I am able to see so many of the of of someone else's body language um, and, I, and I think that's like the vision that we're building towards we want people to be able to communicate with each other as much as they to interact with this uh, mixed reality world so.
Thank you. Thanks for inviting us.